واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين In the past few weeks we have been tracing the subject people in the Quran and one of the communities we are uh, covering their era is the community of the children of Israel and as we do this we come across a lot of issues that require us to pay attention because of the quality of lessons they mean for us as a community and how their life resembles a pilot study for what shouldn't be done by a community of faithfuls, a community of believers. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take us in the next few uh, slides or verses uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah through the, uh, the experience of the children of Israel with Fir'aun and with Musa alayhi salam. So from the outset, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the covenant of the children of Israel to do certain things. We are going to cover this covenant. So we come back to the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken from the children of Israel. A very important commitment that they have made and that is to remember the bounty of Allah. We went over this slide last time, so I'm just reviewing to get the rest of the covenant. And to uh, fulfill their commitment to Allah, for Allah to fulfill the commitment that he conferred upon them, the promise or the covenant. Uh, and to believe in what Allah has sent down, confirming what they have, and to not be the first ones to reject it, deny it, or disbelieve in it, and so that they do not exchange it or buy with it a small price. You know that we think that all of this is relevant to the children of Israel, but Allah has taken His covenant from the prophets, Allah has taken His covenant from the believers in general, that we do certain things, we don't do certain things. Allah has taken his covenant from scholars that they should never conceal what Allah has revealed of knowledge to them or in the revelation, the Quran or the Sunnah. And one of the issues we learn from the children of Israel is the issue of the, the exchange of the guidance of Allah for a small price. You know, even with all the tyrannies in the Muslim world, if just Muslim scholars would stand for the truth and speak the truth, then you would continue and fulfill the sentence. Everything will be fine. Yes, things will have been much different. But the point is, whom are they relying on for living? Muslim scholars, who is sponsoring them? Muslim scholars are paid by governments. So imagine Pharaoh is paying Moses to preach, right? What would Moses preach? What Pharaoh wants him to preach? Would he preach against Pharaoh himself? No. So for our ummah to change the position in which we are of insult, humility, and demotion in which we are, we have to sponsor our own scholars. Our ummah will never be free until our scholars are free from two things. The gold of the Sultan and the sword of the Sultan. They have to be free. They cannot be living under the financial sponsorship of anybody other than the beneficiaries, which are the communities the nation that they serve. But so long as governments steal the waqf money, right? The trust money that Muslims poured into the treasury, 
they steal it and they decide which scholar is acceptable and pay him more and which doesn't deserve it they take them to jail so they have to be free from the pressure and the temptation of anything other than their own conviction to be free we have to pay for them we have to sponsor their life protect their family respect and protect their dignity they represent our deen what else is more important than someone who is teaching us all of us the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when we do not protect them and sponsor them what happens is they go back like everyone else he who pays he says if you pay you say and your say will be carried out so we have sold our scholars and many of them who unfortunately fell in the trap of the sultan they ended up just living for themselves so now we say the scholars are bad no we have to free them the ummah has to free the scholars and this is a central issue here we're talking about selling the ayat of Allah for a small price and we say who does this it's scholars primarily right the rabbis the ministers the imams sheikhs right but if you look throughout our history Muslims from the time of the Sahaba until recently they never entered into a fight against occupation or exploitation or anything else without Muslim scholars being in the front line when they were free they led the community in the front line now when they are not free those of them who are free in their spirits are lounging in jails and those of them who are living according to the Sultan right they are cursing us who want justice and fairness and normal living and normal life because they think we are a liability for them anyone who speaks truth becomes a liability why because if you live for Pharaoh you will never be able to speak truth to power but if you live for the sake of Allah and you are independent in your life you're secure and you are not afraid you have your provision coming to you from Allah through your community so the first battle for the freedom of our ummah is the fight of the people to take over the money that the governments have stolen all over the decades and the centuries this has to be the first business order that we to free those people who deserve freedom the most because our freedom is hinged on their freedom so this is not about the children of Israel even though it is in the context of the children of Israel but it is not limited to their generation or their community it is our generation and our community as well so when Allah says وَلَا تَشْتَرُوا بِآيَاتِ ثَمَنًا قَلِيلًا this is not exclusively directed at the children of Israel it is also us and we have to do this as we mentioned before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he instructed us addressing the Qurashites Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called them to worship him what did he say he said فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الذي أطعمهم من جوع وآمنهم من خوف let them worship the Lord of this house who fed them after hunger and secured them after fear for scholars to work for the ummah the ummah has to give them freedom from the sword of the Sultan and from the gold of the Sultan they have to be free so that they speak truth to power and they are able to lead the ummah you look at the major battles even those that were fought hundreds of years you will find that 
uh, leaders like Salah al-Din was surrounded with scholars. Saif al-Din Qutuz himself was a scholar and he was a leader as well. And he was surrounded by scholars. You look for the Mamalik in Egypt, uh, those Mawali and slaves, uh, they were scholars. They were not gangs and uh, community monsters. They were servants and slaves, but they were scholars. So when the Ummah defends the scholars, they are defending the word of Allah that is carried by the scholars. They are defending their dignity as a community, and they are showing the tyrant which side they are on, Pharaoh or Moses and those who follow Moses. Very, very important issue. So that part of the covenant, and in reality, all the elements of the covenant apply to us as much as they applied to the children of Israel. Those scholars who are giving false fatwa, confusing truth with falsehood and falsehood with truth to, to confuse the community, those who are coming and saying uh, hijab is a matter of culture, those who are saying what the government wants them to say, that you know, raising a lot of children is not Islamic, only get one or two. Those who are working according to government programs because they want the government to pay them more. So if the government kills Muslims and calls them terrorists, they ride and run to the bandwagon and say, yes, they are terrorists. And we have seen people coming all the way from overseas to tell our president here to consider this group or that group as a terrorist organization because they are political opposition. So what I am trying to do is to get you to see the reality around us through the prism and the lens of the Quran because the Quran is distinguished for being a living and lively book. If we make it irrelevant to our reality, we are divorcing the Quran from our life. If we think independent from the Quran, we are rendering ourselves irrelevant to life, but the Quran will continue to be relevant to everybody's life. The Quran will never be separated. Even your enemies are studying the Quran to see how to deal with us. So we better study the Quran and see the world through the lens of the Quran. Don't confuse truth with falsehood. Don't conceal the truth. The truth is the West has waged and is waging a serious campaign against Islam and Muslims. How do you separate the two anyway? <laughs> is there such a thing that's called Islam? Islam is a faith, right? So if somebody is indiscriminately attacking all the Muslim world, or much of it, they cannot claim they are not fighting Islam. But I'm not saying this to arouse your emotions. I'm saying this to recognize it as a fact and work with whatever good means, legal means to change this situation. This situation, if it continues, our children will be even worse off than where we are. Do we want to let our next generation be in more humiliation than we are? Less safe than we are? Less secure than we are? So, وَتَكْتُمُ الْحَقَّ وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ When you know the truth, don't conceal it. When you know what is right and what is just, don't hide it. And don't confuse truth with falsehood. لَا تُلَبِّسُ عَلَى النَّاسِ دِينَهُمْ If you're asked for witness or testimony, give only what is just and fair and truthful. This is what we need to do as individuals and as communities so that our life with, will be full of truth and truth is always protected by Allah. So you will be protected by siding with truth and justice and compassion and mercy and peace and all of the values we learn from our deen. Then, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Establish prayer. 
وآتوا الزكاة offer your زكاة and give your زكاة out آتوا it includes to give it includes also to reach out with your zaka to those who deserve it there's a difference between sitting and calling people to come to you the quran says atu which means take the zaka to the poor don't ask the poor to come to get your zaka atu it's different from ata ata yati is to come but here atu Take it to them. وَرْكَعُوا مَعَ الرَّاكِعِينَ The companion's name that I'm going to tell his story uh, escapes me, but I was reading last night in preparation for this, and there was a companion who accepted Islam, but he was a man of status in his days of pre-Islamic conviction, and he told the Prophet, I cannot find it in my heart to bow my body for anybody. So I will kneel. I will only kneel, which means to get down on his knees, but his body is straight up. And the Prophet ﷺ ignored what he says. He didn't say him to him, this is enough or this is a beginning. He just ignored it. And few days into his prayer, he comes to the Prophet and he prays like everybody else. And he says, now, O oh Prophet, I find it in my heart to bow down and I feel very happy to bow down. So some people will start their practice of Islam with some short uh, compliance or short exchanging themselves. And we need not to be critical and jump on them. We need to give them room. Allah who opened his heart for Islam will open his heart to bow down and to prostrate. So the Quran is telling the children of Israel to pay, to establish prayer, pay the zakah, and to bow down. And you see the zakah is couched between prayer and prayer because a ruku'a is prayer, right? And a salah is ruku'a and sujood. So the zakah is couched in the middle. Your financial responsibility is as important as your salah. And that also shows that in the original instructions given to the children of Israel, and likewise the early generation of followers of Jesus, their salah were like ours. You read in the Old Testament, Moses and Joshua and Ibrahim, all of them fell on their face and prayed. You read in the New Testament, Jesus fell on his face and prayed. Falling on their face means what? What are they doing? They are in sujood. They are in prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is not us who are coming up with a weird form of prayer. I'm saying this to our children in particular and to those others who don't know what the situation is. So we are the ummah that is reviving the way prophets worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are not inventing anything, including the hijab. The hijab is also mentioned in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. That a woman should cover her head and cover her body when she goes in public. And in America, people used to dress hijab-like dresses up until about uh, 100 years ago. Women used to dress properly. Even after that, movie stars, they used to dress hijab-like clothes, loose fitting from uh, top to bottom, like the Muslim women dress that we know. So I want you to understand that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was a follower of previous prophets and a concluding messenger of all the messages that came across the ages and it's only one message. It is a message of Islam, the message of submission. So we are not the weird community in the middle of the mainstream Judeo-Christian culture. We are the mainstream in the community of believers throughout the ages. We are not the odd community. And we are not the outlier of humanity. 
We are humanity, and humanity is those who follow the prophets in good conviction and in good faith. So we try to do this. So don't feel that you are a stranger where you are. Even if everybody disagrees with you, you are following from Nuh, Adam, Nuh, uh, Ibrahim, everybody. So what is the summary of the covenant? The summary of the covenant is given to us in ayah number 12 in Surah Al-Ma'idah. We cited several ayat from Surah Al-Baqarah. Here is the summary. وَلَقَدْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ مِثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ وَبَعَثْنَا مِنْهُمُ اثْنَيْ عَشَرَ نَقِيبًا وَقَالَ اللَّهُ إِنِّي مَعَكُمْ لَإِنْ أَقَمْتُمُ الصَّلَاةِ وَآتَيْتُمُ الزَّكَاءِ وَآمَنْتُمْ بِرُسُلِ وَعَزَّرْتُمُوهُمْ وَأَقْرَضْتُمُ اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا لَأُكَفِّرَنَّ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ وَلَأُدْخِلَنَّكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ فَمَنْ كَفَرَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ مِنْكُمْ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ سَوَاءَ السَّبِيلِ So this is the summary of the covenant that has been spread over several ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah to believe in Allah, to worship none but Allah, to establish the basic pillars of Islam. And, and the pillars of Islam are as good from those days as they are today. So uh, in, in this covenant, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them to support the prophets, to believe in the prophets, and to lend your support to them. What did they do? They killed their prophets, right? What do we do to our prophet? Are we following our prophet? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are we tracing and tracking his footsteps? Are we following his path towards paradise? See, when we read the Quran talking to a historic community, we should not leave the discussion as a historic story. The discussion is also still about us because we are all going to be responsible for this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to clarify this issue, Allah says, لَيْسَ بِأَمَانِيِّكُمْ وَلَا أَمَانِيِّ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ It is not up to your wishful thinking or the wishful thinking of the people of the book. مَنْ يَعْمَلْ سُوءًا يُجْزَ بِهِ وَلَا يَجِدْ لَهُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ وَلِيًّا وَلَا نَصِيرًا so when it comes to responsibility to comply with Allah's covenant with us, we, the people of the book, cannot live in our own wishful thinking. They say, we are the children of God and He loves us and Allah answers us. And He says, قُلْ فَلِمَ يُعَذِّبُكُمْ بِذُنُوبِكُمْ Why does He put you to torment because of your sins? If you are His beloved children and we Muslims believe Inna Allah ghafoor rahim and whatever we do will end up in paradise as if there is no requirement as if enrolling in the club that you call the Muslim community just enrolling is all what you need to do but this is not a fee or a club for fee it is a club for practice if you practice what you are expected you fulfill your commitment you become a real member of the Muslim club. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises after all of these clear instructions a question. أنفسكم, do you criticize people for the wrong they are doing and command them and enjoin them to do what is good and you forget yourself? Believe it or not, whenever I stand to give advice, I remember this ayah. I remember the ayah of Surah Al-Saf. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, lima taquluna ma la taf'alun. When I am short of anything I am sharing, I feel ashamed of myself. It's a serious responsibility. Kabura maqtan inda Allah an taqulu ma la taf'alun. It's most hated by Allah that you say to others what you do not do. But we have to deliver the message even if I am short, which is a fact. I have to deliver the message. 
and the Prophet ﷺ instructed people in the last farewell sermon on the Mount of Arafah. He says, فليبلغ الشاهد منكم الغائب Let the one who is present communicate the message to the one who is absent. And he gives a reason. He says, فرب مبلغ أوعى من سامع Maybe someone who hears my words second hand is more cognizant and more inclined to apply it than the one who heard it first hand. So we have to deliver the message, but we have to practice what we preach because otherwise the threat of the most hated thing in the eyes of Allah can befall us. Don't play with your phone. Yes, please. I know that you're not playing, but don't use the phone. Thank you. So, أتأمرون الناس بالبر Do you enjoin people to do what is good and what's righteous and forget yourself? Because uh, the Jewish community in the Medina, because they have the knowledge, but they didn't want to believe, they would tell the Arabs, yes, he is a prophet. And they tell them, but why don't you follow him? No, leave us alone. We are told that the next prophet will be from our community. So this is a prophet, but he is for the Arabs, not for us. And this is the reason behind this ayah. Do you tell people, do you enjoin people to do what is good? And you forgive your own self? وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ You recite the book. You have the description of the Prophet Wasallam. You have the description of his community. You have the description of the circumstances in which they live. The story of the migration from Mecca to Medina is in the Old Testament. And there is much more for us to look at. And one day, inshallah, I'm going to give you a lecture on this topic, which I did years ago, but it's time to repeat it, about what the Bible says about Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah is saying, وَأَنْتُمْ تَتْلُونَ الْكِتَابِ You are a people of knowledge. You're not ignorant. And you're telling people to follow the truth. And you, out of arrogance, refuse to believe how deprived you are that you command people to do what is good and you ignore it. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Don't you have reasoning? Can't you connect what you're saying and match what you're doing to what you're saying to check with yourself if you are faithful or not? And then it goes on. وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ Seek help and seek support. Seek spiritual growth and spiritual development both in patience and prayer. Patience is to abstain and to hold steadfast. Patience, the Arabs would say, قَتَلَهُ صَبْرًا which means either he caged him until he died or he tied him to a tree as people used to do and let him die tied in the tree or crucify him and let him die. All of this قَتَلَهُ صَبْرًا He killed him by fixating him that he cannot move. So a sabr is to hold on to your patience, to hold on to your principles, to hold on to your values, to give yourself a chance to reflect and ponder. In the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, a sawm nisful sabr, wa sabr nisful iman. Fasting is have the patience, and patience is have the faith. Very important to remember. And the connection between sabr and salah is that in salah, you are fixated in your position. You cannot move. You cannot even move your head. You cannot move your eyes to hunt what is around or to observe what is going on. You are fixated in silence and khushu'a and submission and humility for Allah because when we pray, we're standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاسْتَعِينُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَالصَّلَاةِ Take help or seek help from patience and prayer. 
وإنها لكبيرة إلا على الخاشعين It is difficult except for those who have heart submission that they are willing to stand motionless This is what the word خشوع is to be motionless وترى الأرض خاشعة خاشعة means in the other ayah وترى الأرض هامدة هامدة means motionless خاشعة means هامدة what it means motionless so when you stand in prayer you don't move your hands right and left you don't move your head right and left when you are in ruku' you don't raise your head above your back when you are in sujood you stay still when you sit down you stay still those of us who pray very quickly the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam described it as uh, the bird who is picking seeds or something that it is just done very quickly and a man was praying fast and the prophet told him repeat your prayer because you have not prayed three times until he told him what he is missing the man asked him what am i missing he said this is how prayer should be he said when you make takbir you enter into the prayer and you stay motionless when you are motionless you have the chance to reflect on what you're reading you have a chance to empty your heart from anything that busies your head or takes over your thinking you have the chance to reflect on your position in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa innaha lakabiratun illa ala al-khashi'een those who are humbly submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who are those? those who certain that they are going to meet their Lord الذين يظنون ظن here means certain not doubtful doubtful means شك but ظن is a dual meaning word it is called من أسماء الأضداد أو كلمات الأضداد it works as شك and it works as يقين here it means يقين الذين يظنون those who are certain they are going to meet their Lord and that they are going to go back and return to him I think I will stop here and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us and to guide our hearts and to open our hearts to his obedience Allahumma ameen Alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhin astafa wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu wa ba'd my dear brothers, the last few days bombardment of Syria with chemical weapons and then followed by Tomahawk missiles uh, are a very strong reason for concern for every human being, not only for Muslims. We have to carry the banner of moral responsibility. You don't have to be a politician to stand for your morality. And you don't have to be a politician to call another politician to his moral responsibility to stand for truth and justice. The Syrian people have been subject to the most inhumane and longest war in the Middle East ever. And this is truly a world war against one small people people who are not more than few millions and they are attacked by allies of so many nations I don't know the number if it's 80 or 70 or whatever the number is but it is inhumane it is unconscionable and if our conscience would allow us to sleep after seeing the pictures and hearing the news and watching the videos it means that our conscience is dead and I hope that that's not the case I hope that we at least keep them in our prayer but they need our stance they need us to stand up as Allah commanded us in Surah Al-Nisa Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kunu qawwameena bil qist Shuhada'a lillah Be you standing for justice 
witnesses unto Allah. When you bear witness to truth and bear witness against injustice, you are doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is his assignment. In Surah Al-Ma'idah, the one that followed, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, kunu qawwameena lillah, shuhada'a bil qist. Be you standing for Allah, witnesses for justice. Very important that we take these ayat seriously. Speak up, write to your representatives, shower them with your mes- mes- messages of consciousness, morality, principles, values, and ethics that we, the Muslim community, share with the nation in which we live. This nation was meant to stand for justice. It was meant to stand for religious freedom. It was meant to stand for the poor, the underprivileged, the exploited, the manipulated, the helpless, the weak, the orphan, the needy. And it used to stand for those until the Zionist movement took over. We need to reclaim this country back to the people and back to the values that made this nation stand tall for a long time until recently. We need to work for that. This is our responsibility. Don't wait for lobbyists to come from the East. They will not come, even though some of them are here in Washington, but only for the wrong reason. We have to stand for the right reason. Allah says, وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ لَفَسَدَتِ الْأَرْضِ Were it not for Allah pushing people by each other, corruption would have spread on earth. And indeed, it did happen. Corruption is all over the place. So please, take your role responsibly and act actively and get engaged. Don't sit down. Don't sit on your hands. Don't use the cozy comfort of your home while we know that hundreds of thousands of children in Syria alone have been killed unjustly. How, how could you kill a child justly? It's unconscionable. And our silence is itself unconscionable because we are a community of conscience. Allah told us that the, the distinguishing factor about us as Muslims is لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا To be witnesses against those who commit evil and wickedness. And so that the messenger will be a witness against you or for you. So brothers and sisters, let us take what is going on seriously. At least a word of advice and leadership so that the leaders who don't hear our voices assume one of two things. Either we are afraid to speak for our own safety. I don't know what threatens our safety if you speak. You live in the freest of nations. Why should we be afraid to speak up? Again, it's injustice. It's unconscionable. So they will assume either we are too afraid to speak or that we accept what's going on as normal, which it is not. Not according to our deen, not according to our values, not even according to the constitution of this land. So brothers and sisters, make a resolution today to be the conscience of America, the conscience of Muslims, the conscience of your ummah to speak truth to power no matter what the price is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to stand for truth and justice. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, wa afina fi man afayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa qina wa asrif anna sharr ma qadayt. Allahumma qsim lana min khashiyatika ma tahulu bi baynana wa bayna ma'asiyatik, wa min ta'atika ma tuballighuna bihi jannatak, wa min al-yaqeen ma tuhawunu bi alayna masaib al-dunya, wa matti'na Allahumma bi asma'ina wa absarina, وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا 
اللهم بلغنا رمضان اللهم بلغنا رمضان اللهم بلغنا رمضان اللهم لا تدع لنا في يومنا هذا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مبتلا إلا عافيته ولا مدينا إلا قضيت دينه اللهم لا تجعل بيننا ولا منا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا مجاهدا إلا نصرته ولا ساعيا في الخير إلا وفقته اللهم اشف مرضانا ومرضى المسلمين وارحم موتانا وموت المسلمين I just wanted to uh, brief everybody who knows brother Atif Abu Hamda he used to pray with us here and he passed away in Egypt in the past few days may Allah bless his soul and accept him into his merciful hand أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة